I have doubts about the assumption of a prototype. I think it's working in some ways, but not in others. And this is where I've become interested in yet another way of approaching the translation form. This is going back to James Holmes, who didn't just draw trees, he also had fans. Uh, and this is taken, actually reproduced in an essay called Fans of Holmes. Uh, uh, <laughs> now, now, Holmes, this is, this is cunning thought, and I, I, you've got to remember the, the deep, dark history of translation studies and bring these things up. Uh, Holmes is dealing with the problem, what is a poem translation? How can I define what a verse translation is? Uh, and he says, well, look, there's this range of products. Let's start over here. Poems inspired by poems. This is the meta-literature type stuff, okay? Poems about poems, imitations, and then you get to a, a degree here which is very close to the, the source, okay? But at the same time, you've got another continuum over here, critical essay on language of poems, okay? I, in another language, so you've got the language switch moving in here, and then a prose translation, which is like a description without the verse form, and then that overlaps here. And here is the thing I want to define. But it's in relation always to these things over here and to these things here. And so the form is defined, but it's positioned in relation to many also valid, also possible forms of communication. And I find this quite profound as a way of thinking about form. Rather than good who, who, who excluded, you know, let's not look at those ones, let's not, let's not look at, don't look at the kiwi, don't look at the, what's it called? The dinosaur that flies, that one. Thank you. <laughs> Translators know a lot of things. Um, and people who've traveled. <laughs> okay. Uh, he's saying, let's look at these other things at the same time as the form that we're most interested in because these are alternatives to it. And if you can't do that one, you might want to move that way, and you might want to move that way. Why exclude them? Now, this is a kind of thought that was present at the very beginning of translation studies and has been sidestepped, I think, as we tried very hard to become a discipline or an interdiscipline uh, without awareness of this range of possibilities and alternatives. I've been using that model, trying to think of different ways of doing it. My problem isn't so much verse or literature these days. Uh, for example, texts that report and discuss. You might think about the Bible, texts on the Bible, or a preacher talking about the Bible, or a Bible study group, if you're into that. Or Think about uh, fan-based, uh, illegal dubbing of Hollywood films done between people who just love to get together and talk about it and talk with each other about translation and talk with each other about the film while they're producing, uh, sorry, these, these subtitles. Yeah? And then another act, um, side of the fan for me uh, would be the different things that can be done with the fact that a person speaks more than one language. Most of the world does speak more than one language outside of the United States or Britain. Anyway, um, <laughs> that if you're not going to translate, many people resort to the use of a lingua franca, such as we're doing now, right now. The pigeons, the development of creoles, were also handling this problems, uh, these problems. Uh, where I live in Spain, regularly people are moving between English, Catalan, and, and Spanish in, in multiple code switching and code mixing. And uh, increasingly, uh, we have degrees of intercomprehension, where if I were speaking Catalan now, the people, the Italians would understand me perfectly well, and the Spaniards would pretend not to, but they would really. <laughs> okay? Uh, the fact that people do understand, or, or uh, Serbia, uh, Serbi, um, Serbian, Croatian, etc. Uh, wonderful case of intercomprehension. You don't need translation. So, translation for this, you can imagine. I can't draw the fan. I don't know how to do it. But if you want an intellectual problem to work on, draw a fan with these elements in it, and an overlap where we would have the translation form and the alternatives to translation. One set at the bottom, and the other set at the top. 
Okay? A valuable intellectual exercise, I suggest. My own contribution, however, has been going that way, but my two sides of the fan, if you will, my two dimensions, are firstly quantity. Source text and target text, translation. I started to say start text and translated text. Anyway, are assumed to have quantitative similitude. And I'm not going to do any absolute mapping, but, but I'm going to say there's the assumption that's testable. If you add material on this side, something should be added on that side. A sort of mechanistic. But we're not going to say how much, because there are so many other factors involved. This is an interesting thing to test. Um, you could, you, I've been looking at some court trials where, where, and I'll show a video I think on Wednesday. Um, when the translation is visibly much longer than the source text, how do you feel as a receiver of that? Uh, what's, what, what, he said all that? Wait a minute, where did that come from? You know, and even worse, when the translation is much shorter, and the source text. You're going to see a, an interpreter working in Afghanistan, and, and an old man tells a long and very profound parable, and the translator summarizes it in one sentence. <laughs> uh, okay, if the quantities get out of kilter radically, you lose trust in mediation and you lose the translation form. The quantities, if they're radically out of kilter, can break something, and that what they're breaking is the translation form, or the social trust invested in that translation form. And that is a continuity, and that could fit a prototype concept, okay? And, that's, and you can do a, empirical experiments on that. Just, just make the translations a bit longer, a bit longer, and you'll find people have this breaking point where, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not that. At the same time, there's something else. So basic, we forget about it. Unless you have kids, usually three to four have to deal with personal pronouns, which are hard, okay? And will not deal or understand with what we call the alien I, okay? If I am tired, I'm not tired, but imagine I'm tired. And you're an interpreter over there, and you, the interpreter, says, I'm tired. The audience is going to understand, I hope, that the I is this speaker and not that interpreter. Unless the interpreter is really tired and then they have problems because they can't use the, the first person because another person is using their first person. You understand what I mean? <laughs> All right? There is this linguistic trick called the alien I when the person producing an utterance is not the first person referred to. Mm -hmm. And you can find cases of that in acting, for example. Okay, it's a character, not, not the actual physical person, but it's something that translators do all the time. And people forget about it. Come on, if you come out and say, the translator is really an author, all right, I can understand that. Translators are creative, they edit text, they select text, they take responsibility for text, I hope, in some cases, in situations. But wait a minute, there's this little bit of linguistic evidence out there in our cultures in Europe that suggests that translators use the alien eye, translators and interpreters. And authors don't use the alien eye. And are you just going to ignore that? Did that just disappear? Did it become non-operative? Was it theorized out of existence? I don't think so. More to the point, it is relatively discontinuous. It's not an absolute break because often pseudo-translations can be read against the grain, and in some situations a translator will be taken to court or have a fatwa issued against them, as the translators of someone Rushdie discovered, and they do assume auctorial responsibility as if there were no alien eye. But some of us would like to say, well, wait a minute, it was only the translation. Tour? And wait a minute, we do have this institution, linguistic institution, called the alien eye, which should enable a more subtle distribution of responsibilities. Okay. There is debate about it. There are situations, whole court cases that can happen in between that borderline or across and around that borderline, but it's not 
like the prototypes. Okay? The quantitative thing is, because you get these borderline situations of doubt, but the linguistic thing with the pronouns is not. Um, I call these maxims in the Gricean sense because maxims are things that can be broken, are broken, and are meaningful in the breaking. Okay? And in my very early book in 1992, I go through a whole lot of situations where I test texts that break these maxims. For example, a poem, uh, a history of the kings of England, where the translator, after about 50 pages, suddenly speaks in the first person. You know, what? What happened? Where did this eye come from? And it's actually the translator disowning the text, because it happens to be criticizing the current monarchs. Uh, but in the middle of the actual translation, no footnote, no division or anything like that. And uh, I, I, I'm still fascinated by these breakings of the maxims, which affirm the existence of the maxim. Okay? Uh, I'm at no point saying, these are things that are never broken, these are things that are universally respected. Like Grice and his maxims, I'm saying, when they are broken, they are meaningful, they create meaning. Like a metaphor breaks the maxim of something. Truth, maxim of truth, metaphor. Yeah. Now here's where I want to go. That's sort of my old work on that problem. And it's stuck there for a few years. I didn't know. That's where I am. Well, what do we do with that? I don't really know. I want to go further. And I want to go further in the sense of ethics. And I think this is a challenge to anybody working in translation studies. We have to be aware, I think, that the, the real problems we're dealing with are radical misunderstandings between cultures. The real aim is to promote understanding or solidarity across cultures. And that that is a fundamental ethical call. And it's not easy in the realm of translation. Now, I go back to Habermas, and I'll do it today, and I'll do it in the other two lectures as well, as a representative of the Enlightenment and of reason. And Habermas, as you'll know from his pragmatics, uh, tries to base his view of society on what he calls universal validity claims, such that an utterance will be considered valid if there is the speaker implicitly uh, makes a claim to the truth of what is said or presupposed. They're, they're rather like Gricean maxims, in fact. A claim to normative rightness, that is, what I'm saying is appropriate to the receptive situation in which I'm saying it, that I've, I've adjusted to allow for your relative knowledge and interest in what I'm saying. And the speaker is being true or sincere. Ah, it's really saying three. Habermas was so, is so frightened of society being based on lies that he had to insist three times that we tell the truth. If you've ever done literary stylistics, you know, is it Epson, seven types of ambiguity? No, no, take, take me not to leather. Um, if you say no, no, three times, it means you really want to go there. Uh, if you say don't lie three times, it means, wait a minute, you know people are really lying. That language is, is going to be trickier than what you really think it can do. It's this distrust of language that, that intrigues me here. The pragmatics falls down in many other instances. But uh, the felt need to base social relations on an ethics of communication is important here and, and, and will become important in Lumen later on. My problem is that these kinds of claims sort of can hold in the hardcore center of a culture where people know each other rather well, where you've built up relations of trust, and we can pick irony, jokes, or deviations and reduce them down to intentions, you know, with, with a certain degree of, of, uh, of calculated risk. You know? Within a culture where you know each other very well, you can do, or in your family. You know, you know what people mean, even though they're saying the opposite. And you can communicate all these very subtle messages because you've got these claims in place. 
But when you get to the borders of a culture, the frontier areas where cultures overlap with others, where the only thing we know about the communication situations that we deal with is that these sort of claims are always in doubt, then the ethical problem becomes rather stronger, rather more obscure. We can't trust because I know that person and I know what they usually do. Uh, the cases of, you know, if you're a, a, a user of English, you know very quickly, uh, if you're Australian in any case, cut out the irony, it will not be understood. Don't tell cricket metaphors, to get them out, that will not be understood at all. Okay. And you edit yourself out uh, to try to get closer to something like this, to try to simplify the contact situation. But never entirely, it remains problematic. Let me test these validity claims. A claim to the truth of what is said. It seems to me that the fact of pseudo-translations and the fact of translations in general as a form does not involve a claim to the truth of what is said. This man here, oh, you can't see Fred. This is Fred Leuchter. Leuchter, I don't know how you pronounce it, Leuchter. Leuchter. Leuchter, despicable little man. Um, he's the man who went to Auschwitz and claimed to prove that the Auschwitz lies were not lies. Okay, and he published the Auschwitz report on this. Uh, there's a film on him, actually. This is from the film. Okay. Now, he can do that. Uh, he was taken to court in Canada for this, but, but got off. Um, and in the United States, you can publish this as free speech. Okay. He was invited to Germany, and this is in Weinheim, in Germany, where he is speaking in English, denying the reality of Auschwitz. And so it was physically impossible that so many people could have been killed there. And that's illegal in Germany. You have a law against Auschwitz, against lies about Auschwitz, okay? But they didn't prosecute him because he was speaking English. And the law applies to Germany. So they thought at the time. It's a long story. But what is interesting is that he was speaking English, and this man over here, Gunther Deckert, interpreted him in German. Who was prosecuted? The speaker or the translator? <laughs> the translator. The translator was prosecuted. He went through three court cases and was finally condemned for this. The translator was held responsible for the truth of what was said. Okay? But the fact that it took three court cases to get there, and the fact that he was held responsible not because he acted as a translator, sorry, interpreter in this case, but he just happened to be the head of a neo-Nazi party that organized the event, meant that he was in fact condemned for having brought this guy in and told, you know, for, for what he was politically rather than what he was as a translator. That's, it, it, it's more complicated, it's a, the fact of the complication suggests to me, uh, and the fact that the first defense, which was um, successful, suggests to me that the translation form, in the first instance, protected him. He could say, I'm only the translator. This guy said it. Shoot him, but he went back, he went back to the United States, okay? Uh, and he was prosecuted, and uh, <laughs> it took a long time to get there. Uh, it suggests that normally in our cultures, the translator is not held responsible for the content of what he said. Otherwise, you would start prosecuting every translator of Mein Kampf or every translator of a text we don't agree with, and that is untenable. We won't know what's going on in the world. Okay, that, that the translation form, such as we have it, contradicts Habermas's first ethical principle. I might add that Fred, Fred uh, later on, went back to Germany to go on to a talk show. Uh, and um, he went to the television studio, went in, he was in the makeup room, and two policemen arrested him. They got him, okay. 
And then he had to pay something like 2,000 euros bail, and he went back to the United States. They let him go, basically. They said, you're not going to go on the television talking about this. We will arrest you to stop you talking, but hey, go back to the United States, go away. Uh, so the problem was handled, but the problem was a problem of the translation form, of its limits and its protection. Okay. Normative rightness, that is suitability to the reception situation, uh, taking into account the capacities of the people involved in the Speech Act, seems to me the one area where Habermas's ethical principle holds. That translators can and should be responsible for that. And that's the impact of what we know as Scopos theory, I think. Uh, but also adaptation, also dynamic equivalence. All that thing that says, beware of whom you're speaking with. Ensure that their capacities are accounted for. And I don't think I have a lot to say there. It's just interesting that that one, the first one we have serious doubts about, the second one we can go along with, and the sincerity of the speaker, no, not at all. The speaker could be lying, it's not my responsibility. I wish Fred Leuchter had been lying, but you know, he wasn't. He, he believed what he was saying, he's a stupid man that he was. Uh, the claim for the translator, according to the translation, translation form, is not the veracity of what is said, but the veracity of the representation. That I am ethically responsible for the representational virtues or otherwise of this text, the one I produced, with respect to the anterior text. But not for the content of the anterior text. That's someone else. That's authorship, and this is translatorship and it's fundamentally different, socially and legally. Not all cultures believe in that. If the translators of Rushdie's blasphemies can be held accountable and killed, then the translation form is not working in those cultures. The translation form, such as I'm elaborating it, is culture-specific, somehow specific to Europe, Western culture, a kind of liberal humanism, it's enabled our cultures to develop a certain way of communicating with the world beyond ourselves. Now, if there is a translation form, how am I going for time? I'm sorry, everyone. That's good. We've got half an hour to discuss, and this is where I want to discuss. I think you've understood where I'm coming from, and now here's the kinds of problems I want to deal with in the future, as do many of us. We have to recognize that the forms of translation we've been dealing with traditionally are going to encounter other forms. Perhaps a fatwa as a different form, and that's something we have to do have to come to terms with. But also this one. This I've taken from my colleague in Stellenbosch, uh, Lech, Harold Lech, who works on interpreting, interpreting history, and he took this from uh, an account of the legal system in southern Sudan and came across this particular text of, about a function in the courts that doesn't appear to exist in our courts. Okay? You've got a translator, also known as a repeater. And I, I'm also interested in the, the Sanskrit Indian language, Anuvad, which means to say again, okay? This, this fact of saying again is an element of the translation form that we don't pay enough attention to as a separate element. Uh, to be more explicit, um, research is done on explicitation as a possible universal of translation. The fact that a translated text spells things out, makes them more explicit than the, the source text in many cases. So an experiment was done, this is in the University of Western Sydney, with Arabic and English. Um, Arabic women telling stories to kids. And they can tell, hear the story in Arabic, tell it in English, hear the story in Arabic, tell it in Arabic. And explicitation occurs in both. What's the lesson? Explicitation may be a part of translation, not because of the language change, but because of the telling again. Okay, uh, so the telling again is, is, is not uh, intrinsic to, to that part of, uh, of, of linguistic performance. Anyway, here, 
you've got the repeating and the translation being mixed up. But in Dinka courts, there is an Agamlong, I have no idea how to pronounce that one, but here you go. Repeater of speech, who repeats more loudly the speech of court members, litigants, and witnesses. So just imagine the shouting out. Uh, sometimes they only repeat the last few words of each statement, which is a, a telling point, because I'm obviously asking, are they responsible for the truth of what is said? No, they're just making sure everybody heard. Okay, otherwise they would have to repeat the whole statement. Huh? There's a kind of echo effect, I love that. Huh? Other times they elaborate on or clarify the statements as they repeat them. Explicitation comes into this function as well, when needed, but it's an un uneven thing, like the translation performance that I began with. Uh, they make the proceedings more audible. It goes on though. And there's a similar figure who repeats like the Agamlong. This is the interpreter, the one who makes quiet voices louder, the repeater. Bujajim, the translator in Arabic, we call it, I have no idea, one who makes the world wider, one who makes clear, who reveals secrets, do tell, who doesn't hide things, who goes straight, not around the bush. This is intriguing for me. Now, to get these descriptions, it would be even better to see the actual performance. Um, when we confront that, I suggest, intrinsically, without, you know, we can't help ourselves saying, well, yes, that's like what we do, but that bit isn't like what we do. That we are testing our concepts of translation in this very encounter and thinking, well, some things could be better and some things we want to know more about. For example, um, one who makes clear or the giving of explanations. Is this person then functioning like what we would call a lawyer? You have, and we become aware that the, the social roles that our cultures divide up are not immutable. That, sure, you can divide up this space, this act, this cross-cultural communication set of problems any way you want. But in that very encounter, in the very effort of interpreting this text and making sense of it and marveling at its creativity, relative to ours, we become aware that we have a translation form. 